Okay, so today I'm going to do a quick video about quarks and looking a bit about antimatter and antiparticles. So what do we need to know? So first thing is that current theory suggests that for every particle there has to be a antiparticle. So that's what the current theory suggests. Obviously that may evolve as time goes on, but that's what the current theory says. Second thing, an antiparticle is identical to a particle except it has the opposite charge. So let's give you an example here. And you've got an electron, which obviously has a negative charge, and its antiparticle is the positron, which is still given the symbol E, but it has a plus next to it. The reason it's called a positron, not an anti-electron, is it just ha it happens to be the first one that was ever discovered, so they actually just gave it a name before they realised what it was. Anyway, moving on. So... With hadrons, the antiparticles have an opposite charge because they're actually made up of antiquarks instead of quarks. So they're made up with the opposite quarks to the hadron that would make up the particle type. And we'll have a look at the different charges of the different quarks in a second. Fourth thing, if a particle encounters its antiparticle, and this does mean specifically its own antiparticle, nothing will happen if, say, a proton meets an antineutron, that's not its antiparticle. It'll be if a proton met an antiproton, or a neutron met an antineutron, or an electron met a positron, that sort of thing, okay? So what happens is, when they meet each other, is you get annihilation. And this is where all their mass is actually converted into energy. And you may have learned about um, E equals mc squared and not known what it means. That's the relationship saying basically how much energy is locked away inside mass or how much energy it will take to produce a certain amount of mass. Okay, so let's take, for example, a proton. It meets its antiproton and we show antiparticles by putting a little hat over them. And what happens is you get photons produced And you actually get two of them. And the reason for this is all to do with conservation of momentum. So you get one going in an upwards direction, one going in downwards. So if you th consider the vertical momentum, it's being conserved. And obviously they're going slightly to the right. If, say for instance, the particles going in had slight to the right momentum, it can be slightly different. The key thing is they form two protons when they annihilate. So let's move on to have a look at some quarks. So the first thing to talk about quarks is actually identify the types and um, obviously their properties. So I'm just going to quickly fill in some antis over there, which I seem to have missed out when I made this presentation. And anti is strange, okay. So first of all, up quarks. They have a positive charge and they are charged plus two thirds. Down quarks are, I use the word opposite loosely, basically quarks are grouped into three types. You have top type quarks and bottom type, and they're in the, th when I said three types, there are what's called three generations of quarks, but you only need to know about three certain ones. Okay. So in the top types we have up quarks, in the bottom quarks we have down. And the other one that you need to know about is the strange quark. So let's just finish in quickly filling in this table. So the strange also has a charge of minus a third and it has strangeness of minus one, whereas up and down quarks are not strange in the slightest and have zero strangeness. Now I'm just going to fill in some blanks over here. So this is what we call the first generation. So the second and this is the third. Now, the ones I'm going to fill in now are not part of the specification, but it is, I think, always important to know what else is going on. So you actually have some other types. So you have top, you have bottom, and you have something called a charm quark. So those ones in black there are ones that are not on the AQA specification. 
for some reason, but I thought it would be interesting to include them just so you know where the where the sort of missing ones are. And what you'll find is during weak uh, decay caused by weak interaction, they can switch between the top type and the bottom type, so up and down switch around, or top and bottom can switch, or strange and charm can switch. Under very complex circumstances, you can actually change between generations, but I really don't want to talk about that, because it's not even close to being relevant to what you're looking at. Most of what you'll come across in the AQA course is switching between the types of first generation, or second generation, or third generation. So let's have a look at the antiquarks. So, as you might expect from our definitions, the charge of an anti-up is the opposite, so it's minus two-thirds. The anti-down is plus a third, and the anti-strange is plus a third also. And a key point is the strangeness of this anti-strange is also flipped. So that's plus one now, not minus one. The other ones are still zero, because the opposite of zero is zero. Okay. So let's just take a proton and an antiproton as an example. First of all, let's think about their charges. So a proton has a charge of plus one, and so therefore an antiproton has a charge of minus one. So how are we going to construct those? So obviously our quarks are going to need to add up to one, so we're going to take two of the the up quarks, or using shorthand u, which gives us four thirds, and then we'll take a down quark to take away a third, giving you plus one. In theory, I guess you could have used a strange one, but protons are not strange particles, so you actually can't have used a strange one. So what must an antiproton be? Well, if it's using the opposite one, so it must have two anti-ups, which gives you minus four thirds, and then an anti-down, which gives you minus one. So those are some quark configurations of particles, and you'll need to be able to work out other ones. So the last thing I want to look at is something called pair production. So I talked earlier about how when a particle meets its antiparticle, they can annihilate to produce photons of energy. Well, if you have a photon of sufficient energy, you can actually use them to produce mass. So it's sort of like back to the E equals mc squared equation backwards. So you actually, I've put photons there, but you actually only need one photon. It needs to be sufficient energy to produce both a particle and an antiparticle. So for instance, a photon might produce an electron and a positron. Now what you'll notice when you draw diagrams of this is they'll go in opposite directions and this is about conservation of momentum again. So you see the photon is coming in horizontally, so to preserve the conservation of momentum they go in equal and opposite directions and if you're in some sort of cyclotron or in CERN they use magnetic fields to achieve this. But you'll see them go in opposite directions to conserve the vertical momentum and they'll have a horizontal component to conserve the horizontal momentum. And so you'll get the particle, the electron, and the antiparticle, the positron. Now to make this a little bit more complicated, what I've seen occasionally when you ask questions is actually, you have these two particles on the left, and you should recognise these are the pi plus and a pi minus. Now with me the mesons, the pi plus is the, and the pi minus are sort of anti an, a particle-antiparticle pair. You can't really say one is the particle, one is the antiparticle, all you can know is that they're like a pair, so they will annihilate each other, as will k plus and k minus. There, when we think about k zero, there is sort of an antiparticle k zero, and likewise there's a pi zero and an antiparticle pi zero. Anyway, so the key thing is you've got a particle meeting its antiparticle, so they can annihilate. And obviously, see this diagram. You wouldn't just get one, you'd actually get two photons being producing. Let's put in the symbol of photons there. And then what you, if those photons have sufficient energy, they can actually lead to the production of some particles. So why not uh, an electron and a positron and an electron and a positron? Now, you see in these diagrams I've drawn electrons. 
Now this is the one that always springs into my mind first because it's the particle with the lowest energy. So it's extremely likely that if photons have high energy that they produce electrons. And obviously the higher the rest energy a particle has, the more difficult it is for a photon to achieve that level of energy to create that particle. So the more common ones you'll find are with electrons and positrons, but that's not to say it's not possible to do other ones too.